What's up? I'm B, and whether you're watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. Today, we are reacting to part two of Milena Ciciati's submission series that she has posted here on YouTube. This is um, how to actually submit to your husband, part two, the application. A few weeks ago, I covered her for the first time ever on my channel, and we reacted to part one, um, which was called Submission Isn't What We Think It Is. And so if you haven't watched that, I would definitely recommend going back and checking that video out because I do give some background info on who she is. And so um, it seems like a lot of people in my audience have not heard of Milena before. So you might just want to go back, watch part one, get some basic facts about her. And then uh, when you're done with that one, come back to part two. But if you already know who Milena is or you've watched or listened to my reaction to part one, then you're caught up. We're all on the same page. We're going to jump right into the reaction after we do win for the week. And if you are new around here, a win for the week is just where you share something positive that has happened to you over the past week, something that you would consider a win. It could be big or small, just something that made you happy, made you feel joy, made you grateful. Whatever it may be, I want to hear it and I want to celebrate with you. If you are watching the YouTube video, you can leave it in the comments section or if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify, you can leave it in the Q&A for this particular episode. My win for the week is that we are now pretty consistently finally out of the 100s in Arizona. It has been an incredibly hot summer and I have just been so desperately wanting the weather to cool off, especially now that we have a hot tub. I bought one last year on this wild clearance from Walmart. It's one of the Intex inflatable ones. It's usually like $400 and I got it for less than 200. I don't remember the exact price, but it was a great deal. And so we had it last year. It was so nice to use when the weather got cooler and I have just been waiting for it to become hot tub weather again. So we're cooling off. The mornings are a little bit crisp. I'm excited about it and I'm super happy that I get to use the hot tub again. So that is my win for the week and I cannot wait to hear yours and celebrate with you. Without any further ado, let's watch part two. Oh, and something super interesting that I did want to talk about just for a quick second is that in the first video that I was reacting to from Milena, I had basically said, um, this is a voiceover. It's her, Jordan, and their kids. They're cooking uh, dinner in the kitchen, and I don't like showing other people's kids on my channel, so I'm just going to blur it, but like that's what's going on in the background. You're not really missing anything. And a lot of you were like, no, those aren't her kids. Those are her friend's kids. She doesn't show her children on her YouTube channel anymore. What? I, I'm sorry, what? I am all for being like, hey, I don't want to put my kids on the internet like that. Like, I just want to respect their privacy. If they're in the background, okay, fine. But I'm not really going to make it a point to show my children. I'm all for that. I'm confused, though, as to why that would be your stance and then you would show someone else's children, why you would make them a focal point of a video that you're putting on your YouTube channel. It really does not make any sense to me because when I saw the video, I'm like, oh, those must be her kids because I haven't seen her kids very often. So I'm like, I don't know, must be her kids in the background. All right, here we go. We're going to blur them. Those aren't her children. Those ch those children are not hers, and yet she's using them for a YouTube video. That's so bizarre. That's so confusing to me. Why would you do that? Why would you put someone else's kids on your channel when you don't put your own children on your channel anymore? It's very bizarre. Anyway, thank you to everyone who pointed that out to me because I definitely did not know that before, so... Interesting piece of knowledge to have. I'm just going to keep it in my back pocket for whenever I may need it in the future. I'm really having a hard time moving on from this because I don't understand the logic behind it, behind like not showing your kids' faces on the internet anymore, but then taking your friend's kids and using them for a YouTube video, which didn't even have anything to do with children. Like, my brain doesn't want to move forward because I can't understand the logic behind that decision, but we're going to have to just keep it pushing and get into the reaction. Oh, 
Okay, so we're starting out kind of the same as the last video. This is just B-roll footage of her in the kitchen. There was a child in there that she was carrying. I don't know if that's one of her children or if she decided to like phone a friend and borrow one for this video. Who knows? In any case, she is carrying a child. There's a clip of her sitting down and eating. Now she's standing at the kitchen sink, presumably doing dishes. So if you're just listening to the audio version of this, you're really not missing anything. It's just like vlog style footage. There's no words on the screen. And obviously, Milena isn't saying anything. We just see the footage and then we hear this music in the background. She did just have a verse pop up on the screen. It was Proverbs 31.10. says, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. Hello, welcome back, you guys. This is Hi. part two of my submission video. So if you have not checked out part one, you need to. You really cannot listen or proceed in this video without having the background and biblical information that I presented in the first one, because all of these are really foundational episodes upon one another. And in order to really get the full context and really understand where I'm coming from, you really need to listen to part one first. So if you have not done that, okay. I will link it below. You can go ahead and watch it. It's really easy to just turn on while you're doing the dishes, while you're driving. Like it's just really easy to just listen to. So definitely do that before this one. But in this one, we are going to be tackling more. So what does it actually look like to submit to your husband like day to day? More of the practical sense because some of us might be like, okay, great. You convinced me. I'm on board. I see it's biblical. I see it is a obligation. It is an act of obedience to do this to Christ. But like, how do I actually do that? Firstly, I'm wondering if she's sitting on a couch and like adjusting and that's why we heard that or if we're going to continue to hear the interference with the microphone. I hope not because it's not super pleasant um, on my ear gates, as <laughs> Farron and Brittany Dawn would say. Secondly, with this video being about submission, obviously I have my own perspective on what submission looks like or what it means, especially as a Christian woman. Um, but I'm not going to go super deep into it. I did kind of give my perspective in part one. And so if you've watched that, you know how I feel about it. You know what my opinion is. I don't feel like I need to necessarily reiterate it in this video. I just kind of want to hear what Milena has to say and react according to that. I mean, if she says something that makes me feel like it is necessary for me to share my perspective on submission as a whole, I will. But but I did already discuss it. Like if you watch that, you know how I feel about it. I just kind of want to react to what she says and whatever comes up. And I trust me when I say that this has been something that I've been having to ask the Lord day in and day out what that looks like for me. Because submission is something that I think like a lot of women, it goes so against my flesh and so against my will. And I literally have to diet to myself every single day because I just naturally, my flesh does not want to be submissive. Naturally, my flesh wants to talk. Naturally, my flesh wants to make my opinion known. Naturally, I want to control instead of being self-controlled. It is a flesh versus spirit versus authority versus obedience and disobedience. And if you are not submitting to your husband, you are actively and choosing to walk in disobedience day in and day out. And if you are choosing to walk in submission to your husband, you are choosing to walk in obedience to the Lord. And I really think we need to wrap our minds around how deep and how serious this is. So let's um quickly talk that this, I mentioned this in the last video, but I'm going to keep saying it in every episode because I want to make it very clear that if you are in a mental or physically abusive relationship, this does not apply to you. If you are in that type of relationship, you need to go to elders, you need to go to pastors, you need to go to authority and you need to seek counsel in that area. You are not called to continue and put up with that type of abuse. It's not acceptable. It's not biblical. And so you need to protect you and your children. So this does not apply to you. But if you... Okay, so I have a lot of thoughts based on that quick little intro. The first thing that really caught my attention is her saying that her flesh, her, she, Milena, uh, has opinions and wants to make them known and wants to share them. But she has to die to her flesh and she has to submit and follow what God would want for her life. She has to be obedient, presumably by not sharing her opinion. Now, 
if she wants to live in a marriage and in a household where she defers to her husband and her husband makes the decisions and is the one who has like the ultimate say over the household, what they do, whatever. If that's how you want to live your life, that's fine. You can make your own choices for however you want to live. But I don't think that that means that you don't even get to share your opinion. Like having your husband be the leader of the household and be the person who makes the decisions for your family does not mean that you don't get to share an opinion. If we think about Paul and Morgan, they they live very much the same way where Paul's leader of the household, he's the man, he's in charge, Morgan submits to him even if she disagrees, but she has made it very clear that she will still share her opinion. She'll fight, she'll go back and forth, she'll be like, no, this is what I want, but then, you know, ultimately she'll let Paul make the decision, which again, if that's how you want to live your life, you do you. It's a free country, you have every right to choose that whether it's right or wrong, whether I agree or not, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Again, even if you are choosing to have the dynamics of your relationship be that your husband is the person who makes the final decision for all things related to your family and your lives, it is okay to still have an opinion. Like you do not have to not share your opinion in order to be a good Christian. I do appreciate Milena once again bringing up abusive relationships and saying that they're not okay. Like, again, the bar is in hell if this is what I'm appreciative of. I do appreciate her denouncing the abuse and saying that it's not okay. It's not what God would want. You don't have to be in a relationship like that. Like, this video is not for you. Don't submit to somebody who's abusive. I appreciate the disclaimer. But I also... uh, want to push back against her saying like, go to, go to seek counsel with somebody who's a leader in your church, go to your elders. No, you don't have to do that. If you feel comfortable doing that, and that's somebody who you want to um, seek refuge and safety in, totally fine. But go to the authorities, go to somebody you trust, go to somebody who you love and who you know loves you and wants what's best for you, regardless of whether or not they are an authority in the church. You don't have to go to a church leader because again, we've talked about this in part one, they might have a motivation to keep you quiet and keep you in that relationship and to protect the person who is abusing you. And of course, I'm not trying to make a blanket statement about church leadership as a whole. I am not saying that that is what would happen in every single instance of reporting to a person of authority in the church. I am just saying that that can happen depending on who you are and who your spouse is and, you know, just different dynamics. So um, if you feel that you need to seek counsel and seek safety, because you are in an abusive relationship and you trust somebody at your church and and they're in a position of leadership and you want to go to them, of course, do that. But you don't have to. You don't have to go to somebody um, because they are in a position of leadership. Like that's not the only way to approach this in a correct fashion. Like just go to somebody who you love and who you know loves you and wants you to be safe and happy and healthy and, you know, rely on them, whoever they may be doesn't have to be somebody in a position of leadership at the church. That's all I'm going to say. You are a wife with a husband who probably plays too many video games or um, can be a little bit lazy sometimes or is a little bit grumpy when he gets home from work. This still applies to you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we are only to submit to our husbands if they are perfect and act like Jesus. We did not marry Jesus. We married our husbands. And so we cannot hold our husbands to the standard of Jesus when we don't even hold ourselves to that standard. So let's go back in to Ephesians 6, 22, because this is where... A lot okay. of the basis and where all of this comes from. And if you guys didn't actually know, my friend and I, Nava, are, we just finished writing a study. So we're going to flip over to Ephesians real quick. And for those of you who missed this, my friend Nava and I actually just wrote a women's perspective and women's lens and a mother's authority in the armor of God, because the armor of God is mentioned in Ephesians 6, which is actually right after. Okay, that was my question. She was like, we just wrote a study anyway. And I'm like, wait, what's the study on? Okay, the armor of God. I did see that on her website because she is selling it there. 
after Ephesians 5, which is where it talks about submitting to your husbands and stuff. So I just thought I'd throw that out there because a lot of what I'm actually going to be talking about today, we kind of talk about in our study of the armor of God, because as a wife, we have so many biblical duties and they're all so foundational. And if you can't even submit to your husband, which is one of the most basic level things that we need to do as a wife, all the other things that we need to do that are so imperative to our children and to our household, like they stack upon one another. Another. And so if we're not even able to submit to our husbands, we're not even able to put on our armor. Like we're not even able to do all these other things that the Bible calls us to do. All right. So Ephesians okay. 5, 22 wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husband. Now, this is really big because I want to bring you back to 22 where it says wives submit to your own husband. I think a huge thing that people misunderstand is that women are supposed to submit to every man. That is no, that's not biblical. It literally here says wives submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. In Ephesians 5 33 it ends, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And this is so big because I feel like sometimes we don't even understand how disrespectful we are being. And I just want <gasps> to encourage you today to ask your husband how he feels respected by you because respect is something that is so big to men and as women we honestly I feel like I'm kind of out of touch with that like I don't really get that but for a man, it is so foundational for them that if they don't feel respected by you, they won't feel loved by you. They won't feel admired by you. They won't feel protective over you. Like it becomes a like domino. Oh, okay. Okay. So at first she was going into Ephesians 5 and I'm like, yep, she talked about this in part one. I thought this was going to be about the application because she said like, I, I, I did the Bible stuff in part one. I went over the biblical knowledge. Go back and watch it if you didn't because this is going to be the practical parts of it. So I was kind of confused as to why we were getting into the verses again because like I said, she already went over this in part one. Then she goes on to say that we don't understand how disrespectful we are being. And for some reason, that just like caught me off guard. You may have heard me gasp. Um, that wasn't really a dramatic thing that she had said. It just it caught me off guard, her saying that we don't realize how disrespectful we're being. Um, because I don't really know what she's talking about. I don't know what she's referring to. If she can maybe provide an example of what she considers to be disrespectful, that may help me understand a little bit better. But then the thing that really got me is her saying that if you don't respect your husband, he's not going to feel protective over you. In the last video, she talked about how even though, and even just now, she's like, you didn't marry Jesus, you married your husband. So even if he plays too many video games or if he's grumpy when he gets home from work, it doesn't matter. You still submit to him. So he gets to be like somebody who is not necessarily doing the things that you would like him to do, but you still have to submit. However, if you're disrespectful to him, he gets to be, be emotionally disconnected from you and not be protective over you, which is his role as the leader of the household. Again, right, wrong, and different. I'm not here to like convince Malena to not follow this line of thinking or to want to choose a different lifestyle. I'm not here to like change her mind on it. I'm just going to say, okay, she wants to submit to her husband and let's roll with it. But for her to say that like, if you are being disrespectful to your husband, he gets to detach from you and not do what he is supposed to do. He doesn't get to, or he doesn't have to fulfill his quote unquote biblical duties because you're falling short. But if he falls short, you still have to step up. Am I understanding that correctly? Is that what I am hearing you say? I think it is. That doesn't sit right with me effect of things. And so for them to feel respected by you is so empowering to them and can make them feel like such a man. And the hardest thing is that it's so natural to us to want to nag our husbands and to control our husbands. But the Bible, the, one of the fruits of the spirit, you guys, is self-control. Self. -control. self. 
control, not husband control. And I kind of talk about this in the first episode, but I really wanted to just keep bringing that up. We are supposed to control ourselves and how we respond to things, not trying to control and respond for our husbands. If you go all the way back to Genesis, what was the even purpose of having a woman? So let's go back to Genesis 3 real quick, because this will help us really understand the whole reason why God even created women and men. So we're in the garden, we're in Eden, Adam's kind of, you know, doing his thing. Then the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of all the ground that the Lord had formed, every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds and to the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fitted for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The man said, at last, it is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, mother and hold fast to his wife that the two should become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So if we go back to the whole purpose of why even a woman was created. It literally says here that God thought that he was alone and that he would make a helper fitted for him. And so we're literally supposed to be helpers of our husbands, not controllers, not their conscience, not their dictator, not their director, not their CEO, their helper. And so I would love love to see what your husband values and what makes him feel respected. And I even asked my husband today, right before I recorded this, because I was like, I'm just so curious to know, because it's not really a question that I think to ask him frequently. And that- is she going to say that she asked him how she can make him feel respected? Because if you're... <laughs> If you're here saying like, I'm going to tell you the best way to submit to your husband, I'm an expert on it, so I'm going to teach you, you would think that that would be a question that you would have previously asked. Also, in case you are keeping track of these verses because you want to go back and do your own reading later, she was actually reading from Genesis 2. Um, She did say that it was Genesis 3, but I'm guessing she just misspoke. But anyway, it was Genesis 2. And then as far as showing respect to your husband... Um, I don't like to stereotype and be like, men typically are like this and women are typically like this. But I do think that external validation is something that is important to a lot of people, but especially men. Like for me, maybe this is just me. Maybe it's just the way I perceive things. Like I don't need someone to tell me that I'm doing a good job to know that I'm doing a good job because it's like, I can evaluate that. I know my effort. I know what I'm doing. Like I know my contributions. And so being appreciated is nice, but like I know my own worth and I know what I can contribute to things. And so that's just kind of like um, where I don't need external validation. It's nice to have, but it doesn't really change how I perceive myself, if that makes sense. I think men need that external validation. And maybe that's just with the people I know and the people that I interact with, your observations could be totally different. But I've just noticed for me that with the men that I know, when somebody that they care about and that they value tells them, you are doing a good job and I appreciate you, it just gives them like this little boost, you know, it just gives them a little bit of a pep in their step. And I do think that everybody likes to be appreciated, like everyone Um, values, feeling respected, but especially when it comes to people who have more masculine energy, it's like you telling them, I appreciate what you do. That makes them feel respected. And from what I have seen, again, just my observation of the people that I know, having that verbal external validation helps them feel secure and kind of helps the relationship grow because they feel that they can be emotionally vulnerable with you because they know that they're being respected. So that's something that I agree with her on. I do think that you should show respect to everybody and especially those people that you love and care about. You should definitely make sure you're being respectful to them. Um, but in general, I think it that having that external validation for men is something that they value a lot. And it is good to know like How can I make you feel respected? What can I do to show you that I care about you? Because everybody has a different love language. It might be quality time. It might be words of affirmation. It might be gifts. Whatever it is, it's good to know how you can make somebody that you care about feel loved and respected and appreciated. So that way you can put the effort into showing them love in a way that makes them feel close to you. And they can do the same for you. You should know your own love language and say, hey, like this is what I need. 
Anyway, back to Melina's point. Yes, respect is important. And knowing how to make your spouse feel respected is also good information to have. So that way you can do that. That's why I'm encouraging you to ask your husband because our husbands are not all the same. There might be certain things that they dealt with in childhood and some things that they, men are different. Everyone's different. And so there might be one thing that makes a one man feel more respected than it versus the next man. So ask your husband. Okay. I want you to be intentional, intimate with your husband and grow and have a PhD in your husband and be your husband's helper. And so in order to do that, we really need to figure out how we can help them. So just simply ask him today, what makes you feel respected? What do I do or don't do that makes that would make you feel respected? Or what have I done in the past that has made you feel disrespected. I'll just quickly share what my husband said. And he said he feels respected when I see him as our protector. It just goes to show like how biblical that is because husbands are called to protect and to provide. And so of course it goes to show how God has just ordained us and God has made us these desires and how he so beautifully created us because my husband feels respected when I view him as our protector. So I just thought that was so interesting, but take note of what your husband and ask him. And I think just even bringing up this conversation will help really guide you and your husband in ways and kind of unveil, unveil things and Get this conversation started because submission, as much as I would love to say it can happen overnight, I think it is a habit and it is a process. And if you have not been under submission to your husband, it will be slow steps. Maybe for you, it won't. Maybe for you, it just clicks and that is amazing. But from my experience, this has been something that I've had to heavily rely on the Lord. And is that not the whole purpose? I'm submitting to my husband because I want to submit to Christ and be obedient to him. Yes, I love my husband. Yes, I want to submit to him. But ultimately, I am doing it because I want to serve the Lord. So I feel like I look beyond the flesh. I look beyond the If you are listening to this episode, then you just missed Melena adjusting the top of her dress like three or four times, and she's not wearing a bra. She's just not. (laughs) Um, I can see that she is not wearing a bra. She's kind of, the way that this is cropped is her um, like torso, kind of her midsection. She's sitting at a table eating and her face is cut off. So you can see the table at the bottom of the shot. You can see her plate of food. You can see her chest area up to like the bottom of her neck. I can see that she is not wearing a bra. Additionally, I did see an Instagram story from her where she said that she doesn't like to wear a bra. Sometimes she'll just put on some pasties and she'll go. And honestly, if your chest is small enough that you can walk around all day without a bra pain-free, I say go for it. Like, I'm jealous, truly, because being five feet tall and having double Ds is not the way to go. Um, It sucks. Anyway, I know that she doesn't wear a bra and she's not wearing a bra now. I don't have an issue with that. Free the nip. But to be a religious influencer in the vein that Milena is going and to talk about modesty and submission and being like a meek little wife, for you to then get on YouTube and post a video where the kind of focal point of this shot is your chest area and then to continually be adjusting the top of your dress and drawing attention to your chest and the fact that you're not wearing a bra seems odd to me because there is such a greater mission here there's such a greater statement here that it needs to be said and so i think just understanding that is already half of the battle let's uh, jump over to first peter three and i don't know if i already said okay. this but this is obviously going to be very heavy on women and wives because that's who i'm talking to i don't have authority to speak to men and so i don't want you to sit here why do we keep going to different verses in the Bible if she said, like, I went over the biblical justification in part one. I thought this was about the practical application. And yeah, she gave us one actionable tip, which was ask your husband what you do or don't do that makes him feel respected or disrespected. And I think that that's a totally fine, like, tip. Like, of course, whether you're going down the submission road or not, again, respect is really important, but we're 10 minutes in. You gave us one thing and feel like all I'm doing is telling you what to do and your husband is off the hook. First of all, change your heart because that's not how we should be thinking. But husbands are called to do specific things as well. So I don't want she you said, to think get it that together, like, ladies. women are called to do things because husbands actually have a 
very, very hefty, hefty list of things that they are called to do. And maybe I could even do an episode where I highlight those things, not to shame our husbands or not to be like, hey, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, but to further enlighten us and to show us how much more they have on their plate and how they are going to go before the Lord and they will have to be judged and testify whether they led you and your children correctly. All we will have to do before we stand the Lord is say if whether we were in submission to our husbands or not. But our husbands are responsible not only for themselves, but you and your children. You are responsible for whether you submitted to your husband or not. So his weight is a lot heavier because he's going to have to go before God. And so that alone is really hefty. But I think it'd be really important for us to see what a man is supposed to do and what God calls men to do, not to shame them, but to be able to properly pray for them, to know exactly what to pray for our husbands. But maybe I won't, maybe I won't, because I feel like we could get hung up on what they're not doing and it might be counterproductive. Anywho, let's go to uh, 1 Peter 3. (laughs) This one I also talked about in the last episodes, but it says, okay, 1 Peter 3, 1, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may may be won over without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see you respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair and the putting of gold jewelry and clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you are her children and you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. That is powerful. And when you read something like this, I feel like it's really easy to kind of just like read it and be like, okay, cool. But if you go back, it's like literally giving us a list of qualities. Is it literally telling us exactly what we are supposed to do in order to win our husbands over without a word? It's literally the conduct of our wives. So any of you who have husbands who are not Christians, they're not going to be won over by you nagging them to come to church on Sunday. They're going to be won over without a word, but by your conduct. So let's walk through those exact okay. things. So the first quality that we are supposed to live out is to be respectful. So again, ask your husband, how does he feel respected? Maybe for him, it's coming home to a well taken care of home and a home cooked meal. And I know some of you might be like, oh my gosh, we are not in the 1800s. Okay. Right. But if your husband is out working all day long, Just put yourself in his shoes. I don't know what would make me feel more loved and more appreciated than coming home to my kids excited, to my wife happy, to the yummy fragrance of the cooking she just made and a well-kept home. Because then home feels peaceful. Home feels welcoming. Home feels like a sanctuary where I get to just dwell and my wife feels like my crown. What's not pleasant to come home to is a wife who just throws the kids at him says, you figure out dinner. I am done for the day. And the house is a complete mess for him to try to pick up. And I'm talking to myself here because in the beginning when we had two under two and I had a lot of work to do and my husband was traveling a lot for work, I found myself being that wife and it is not a pleasant wife. And I am regretting. This is going to be a time where I think Melena might be being a little bit too hard on herself because she's talking about how um, the way that she was speaking implied that in most cases, men are going to be the breadwinners, women are going to stay home, they're going to be homemakers, they're going to raise the kids, they're going to take care of the house, all that. But while Melena was talking, I couldn't help but think, you're not a stay-at-home wife. Like, you, you do those things, presumably, from what we see her posting on the internet, like, yeah, she takes care of the house. She takes care of the kids. She's doing homeschooling. Like she's putting a lot of effort and work into that, which already being a stay at home parent is not an easy thing, but also she brings in money by being a content creator. And then she goes on to acknowledge that when she says that she was a little bit stressed out and frazzled when they had two under two, where she'd be like, here, you, you worry about dinner, which I don't think is the worst thing in the world. I mean, staying home with kids, just at a baseline is a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of mental and physical toll on you as a parent. Then you're going to add in something else on top of it, whether it's a side hustle, an Etsy business, baking, whatever it may be. With Milena, it's content creation and she has a big following. And so you're, you've already got the baseline stress of being that stay at home parent. And then you're adding another job on top of it to be like, 
I don't know, figure out dinner. Here's the kids. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. And maybe she feels bad. Maybe she lashed out. Maybe she wasn't super kind to her husband very often during that time period. Um, I can imagine that she was feeling a lot of overwhelm and stress being the main caregiver of their children and then also working on top of that. And yeah, for him, like, it's nice if you're working outside of the home to come home to a clean house, to a peaceful environment, to happy kids, to dinner cooking on the stove. Like, yeah, that's a nice thing to experience. But I I don't think she's wrong. If she if she was being the main caregiver and also working, I mean, even if she was just being the main caregiver, I would understand being like, I'm stressed. I'm done. I need a break. Here are your children. I totally get that. But especially if she's doing most of the caregiving and she's working on top of that. When your husband gets home, if you're like, hey, I did not have time to think about dinner, figure it out. I'm on Milena's side. Full of being that type of wife because that type of wife does not want what no husband wants to come home to that. And so it was foolish for me to act like that. It was foolish for me to be like that. So ask your husband. What makes him feel respected? Is it you having dinner ready by a certain time? Is it you having yourself put together? I remember there was a click in my mind where I was so grieved to see that I was giving my husband my leftovers. I was so grieved to see that he got the absolute worst of me. He just got whatever was left. And my husband deserves and is supposed to have the best of me. And so I will like redo my makeup a little bit, make sure my hair is done or like make sure I got all the baby vomit off my shirt. Like I make sure to do all these things. So when I get home, my husband comes home to a little nice hot wife that he loves. You know, it's not fun coming home to a wife that just throws the kids at you. And I know it's so easy for us to do that, but how can we respect our husbands? The next quality that they list out here in first period of three is pure. Be a pure conduct. Now I want you to do some homework. I want you to go through your Bible and search what it says about being pure. The Bible has a whole lot to say about this, but being pure goes beyond your sexual purity. It can be pure in the mind, being sober-minded. And this is something that Nava and I actually talk quite at length about in our study because the whole idea of being pure is completely lost in our society. I'm really sorry. I don't mean this to be judgmental or mean. And if you've watched Milena for a long time, please chime in on this. I feel like she is kind of struggling to speak. Like she's mispronouncing words. She just said first Peter instead of first Peter. And I'm not expecting her to come on here and sound super polished, not make a mistake, not use any filler words. I mean, if you listen to my videos, you know that I'll like half start a sentence and it's like a false start. And then I'm like, wait, let me go back. And this is what I mean instead. And so I'm not expecting her to come on here and just recite everything perfectly. But I feel like her words are just kind of mispronounced and she's stumbling over things and some of her sentences don't make sense to me. And again, I'm really, I am not trying to be mean or to be like critical of the way that her brain processes things if this is just how she talks, but it's definitely something that I've noticed in part one and part two. I'm interested in in hearing more about that from people who have watched her for longer than I have. Has she always just been somebody who kind of stumbles over her words or is this more of a recent change? I also kind of wonder if it might be due to her speaking about things that she's not super confident in. I mean, I know when I talk about something that I don't know a lot about, it's hard for me to make a clear and strong point because I'm like, well, I don't really know. Like, this is what I think it is, but I'm not super confident in what I'm saying. So, Maybe it's kind of with the content shift. Maybe she's talking about something that she doesn't feel super confident or competent in. And that's why she's kind of like stumbling over her words. So anyway, like I said, if you've watched her for a long time or you watch her pretty frequently, if you could share your opinion in the comment section and just kind of let me know what your thoughts are on it, that would be helpful. Um, because again, like I'm, I'm really not trying to be mean, but I do think it would be good to know if this is just how she talks in general or if it's kind of a more recent change. 
being pure is just so far removed from the reality of the world that it's like laughable. They think it's funny. They think it's like unattainable. And that's just a lie from the enemy. So I'd love for you to go and seek exactly what scripture says about being pure and how to be pure and holy. The Bible says quite a lot about it. So I would definitely seek and want you to kind of do a little bit of homework to find that out. The next quality is adorning be in the hidden person of their heart to be a gentle and quiet spirit. So right before that verse, it talks about not being worried about the braiding of the hair and the gold of the jewelry and your external appearance, which I feel like that could be a whole nother thing because it's one thing to want to look presentable and want to be beautiful for your husband, but it's a whole nother thing to have it be a lustful thing for other men outside of your home. So I can't check your heart. I don't know. You know that. So here it is telling us to be focused on a gentle and quiet quiet spirit because that is pleasing to the Lord. When we're talking about being a gentle and quiet spirit, that does not mean someone who never speaks because you could never say a word, but your face could say more than anything, or you could never say a single thing, but your thoughts are putrid and garbage. The Lord is talking about being a gentle and quiet spirit. What? He's talking about how you carry yourself. Are you being wise with your words? Can you tell I've been reading Proverbs recently? Because I think Proverbs has a lot to say about being gentle and quiet. So if you have not read Proverbs, I highly suggest it. Read a Proverbs a day because there is so much wisdom in this book. It will really give you a deeper understanding of being a gentle and quiet spirit because being gentle and quiet is very contrary to what we see in our world today. And I think there's so much unlearning that needs to be done because our world tells us that we need to shout every opinion that we ever have from the rooftops and that we need to say any and everything that comes to mind. And that is just unwise. It's not true. You do not. A fool is of many words. A foolish person says everything they think. That's foolish because you're not being selective of your words. Your words don't taste like honey. And a soft answer turns away a wrath. And so being gentle with your words, having a soft answer turns away a wrath. And so if you find yourself with a husband who can easily get upset at things, I think it might be really beneficial to see how we are responding and how we are reacting and how we are responding because First Peter literally tells us that they will be won over not by a single word, but by our conduct. Moving on, before I give you a- Or your husband could be an adult and control their temper. If you have a husband who gets easily upset about things like, Oh, he's really sensitive, so I'm going to make sure that I control myself, but he can just be however he wants. He, It's not my responsibility to control him. I didn't marry Jesus. He can fly off the handle at any time, and it's okay, but I have to check my heart and how I act. Mm. Couple more real practical tips. Let's go to Titus 2 because... T- yeah, please, please give me practical tips. <laughs> like... Please do, because all we've gotten so far is ask your husband how he feels respected and a thought process that leads to victim blaming. Titus 2 also gives us another list of things of what wives are supposed to be and not to be. So Titus 2, 3 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. So here we go again. What are the lists? We are to love our husband and children. What does love mean? Love in the Bible is t- first Corinthians tells us exactly what love is first Corinthians 10 so let's flip on over to her sorry it's first Corinthians 13 so the first thing that Titus okay. 2 women are supposed to call and teach the younger women is to love their husband and children so if we look at first Corinthians 13 because definitions are important what is the definition of love well first Corinthians 13 4 literally tells us love is patient and kind it does not envy or boast it is not arrogant or rude it does not insist on its own way it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So when Titus 2 is saying for us to love our husbands and children, it is telling us to be patient and kind, to not envy or boast, to not be arrogant or rude, to not insist on our own way, to not be irritable or resentful, to not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoice in the truth, to believe all things, hope on all things, endure all things, and to never end our love. Wow, that's a whole lot. I know. It seems like a whole lot. 
If you've not memorized this first, I'm giving you a little more homework. Let's memorize this first. How can we apply this to our life? We need to be patient with our husband. Let's say our husband said he'd be home at five and he ends up being home at 545. And I know sometimes at the end of the day, all you're doing is just waiting and every minute seems like an hour. And so when he walks through the door and he's 45 minutes late, the last thing you want to do is be patient. But love is patient and kind. So we need to be understanding. Okay, I see you got caught up or maybe traffic was a little bit longer. I'm sorry you were stuck in the car. Love can look like this. It's in the small things. It's in the little mundane things that happen day in and day out. Love is not arrogant or rude. How often are we rude or arrogant to our husbands? How often do we think we need to be right? And if we're not right, we're arrogant or we know best or he didn't listen to your advice. Oh, well, see, that's what happens. I know best. That is being arrogant. That is being rude. It is not loving. It does not insist on its own way. It's literally telling us right here how to even be submissive with love. It does not insist on its own way. It literally... That's a really bizarre thing to be angry about. Like she's saying that if your husband said he was going to be home at five and he gets home at 545 and it was because of traffic, you need to be nice. And it's like, yeah. What? Why would you be upset that your husband got caught up in traffic? I could understand um, having a little bit of frustration that traffic is happening and just being like, Ugh, like it's been a really long day. I wish he was home right now. The kids have been a lot, whatever. If if you're a stay at home parent, um, like I could understand being like, man, I wish that you were home right now. But that's not something to get upset at your spouse about. Like, are you were you getting upset with him for being stuck in traffic? I mean, I guess so. Otherwise, she probably wouldn't be using this as an example. But all right just unlocked this for us right here. It's literally telling us in order to submit we and to love someone, you can't insist on your own way because insisting on our own way is so prideful and so arrogant because we think we know best. We don't. And submitting to our husbands and the way he wants to do something, sure, it may not be the way you prefer to do it, but that's not biblical. That's not what we're called to do. Going back to Titus 2. Then it says that we are to be self-controlled. Here we go. Here we go again. I think the biggest thing that women oftentimes struggles with when it comes to submission is that they don't want to be controlled. They want to be controlling. And so they don't want to control themselves. They don't want to use self-control. They would much rather control or manipulate a situation. And I think this <gasps> is the one that's hardest. And this is where I'm going to give a practical thing for me. When I really understand it's interesting to me that she would say manipulate. I wonder where that phrasing is coming from. Um, if it's something that she has arrived to, like if it's a conclusion that she's drawn for herself that women are manipulative or if it's something that has been told to her. Because I think a person wanting to like be in charge of a situation comes from a place of wanting agency and wanting to do what you feel is right or best, not from a place of wanting to be manipulative. Stood the weight that submission holded and how I was in complete disobedience to the Lord by not doing this simple thing every day. What really changed for me, and this is going to sound really silly, but maybe you can relate to this. I started with submission in the car because I found that I was that little wife in the corner. I wasn't being, I was sitting my side. I was being the passenger and I was the type of passenger that would dictate and try to help my husband drive. And by telling him, oh, we have to turn here or, oh, are you going to get over or, oh, there's a car coming. And I found that I was trying to control and trying to like dictate how he was driving and I wasn't being submissive in even that. And that might sound really silly to you and to others, you might be able to completely and totally relate. And so an area where I started practicing submission was in the car. I literally would sit on my hands and I would zip up my mouth and I would just enjoy being in my husband's presence instead of being irritated if he missed the turn or instead of being irritated that he may have gone over the speed limit a little bit or trying to tell him that he needs to turn into the lane a little bit sooner so he doesn't have to do it abruptly. Like, no, no. This is how I introduced myself to submission. It started by doing it in the car. Then I found that it kind of got a little bit easier from here because the car rides became a lot more peaceful. The car rides became a lot more freeing. I, well, yeah, I mean, nobody likes a backseat driver. I was trying to control 
what I didn't need to control. I was trying to have authority in areas I wasn't supposed to have authority. And the Lord so specifically calls a specific structure in order in our homes because that's how he designed it. And so when we go contrary to his design, there's going to be interference, there's going to be resistance, and there's going to be disobedience. And so I found that I was running into the disobedience and how we submit to our husbands and this concept of submission just applies to life in general. How much more freedom would we have day to day if we were in submission to the Lord and to our husbands, knowing that we do not have control over every and every little tiny detail of the days? How much more joy and freedom would we have if we relied on the Lord and his word? How much more freedom would we have day to day knowing that we don't have to control things that are out of our control? It's not my job to control my husband. It's literally telling me here in Titus 2 that I have to be self-controlled. I have to control myself. I have to control my tongue. I have to control my pride. I have to control my speech. And my husband will be won over, not by a single word, but by my conduct, how he sees me living out my life, how he sees me being reverent to the Lord, how he sees me honoring the Lord. This takes a lot of patience. This takes a lot of relying on the Holy Spirit. And that's the thing. We cannot do this on our own. And to think that we can is very foolish. That's why we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to rely on the Lord's strength. That's why we need to go to the feet of the Jesus every single day and tell him, Lord, this is hard. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I can't do this without you. And oh, it's just changed so much. All right, next one. We got to we gotta roll this up. Oh, look at that. What's the next one? Pure. Oh, it's mentioned two times. If anything, this should really sound off some alarms in your brain because if the Bible says something two times, that means you really got to be listening. So the fact that pure is mentioned not only in Titus 2, but then in 1 Peter 3, that should really tell you something because the Bible is not filled with filler words. It's not filled with words that are just fun and just fluffy. No, the Bible is living and breathing in the word of God and it is very specifically placed there. And so if it's mentioned two times, I think that should really get our attention. So again, do that homework on finding out what the Bible says about being pure. Next thing is working at home, taking care of our home, taking care of our kids and taking care of the responsibility that we have at home. And this, I feel like can be a whole nother thing. I've done actually several episodes on my channel talking about how I take care of our laundry and how I take care of our groceries and how I am like the CEO of our home, how I take pride in how I take care of my home because it is biblical. It literally says here to work at home. And so how we take care of our home is also a responsibility. The next one is kind and submissive. All right. I mean, I would just want to beg the question if there were a lot of opportunities for women to work outside of their homes back in the day. I feel like a lot of evangelical Christians or fundamentalist Christians would take that and be like, see, women are meant to stay at home. They're meant to be homemakers. But I think culturally, if we look at what was happening, um, Paul wrote Titus. And so Paul is instructing believers in how they should be behaving. And so it's probably like women who generally stay at home should do a good job at caring for their homes and not that women are always meant to be at home and be homemakers in 2023. And I am not a biblical expert. I'm not the authority on anything. You don't have to agree with how I perceive something or how I interpret a passage of the Bible. This is just how I perceive it. And so the general kind of messaging that I am getting from that passage from the Bible is whatever you are doing, be good at it, like do a good job. And because culturally women tended to stay home, um, if they were married, that was like their role was to be the homemaker. Paul is saying, women, take good care of your homes. That is just how I see it though. To their own husband. Here's the word kind yet again and submissive yet again. There are several things that are mentioned here and in First Peter again, and I don't think that is a coincidence. It is a very intentional thing, being kind. And in First Corinthians 13, it says love is patient and kind. So being kind to your husband is the most respectful thing you can do, being kind to him. How often are we the meanest people to our husbands? The man that we claim to love the most is the one that we're speaking the most harsh to is the one that we're putting down the most. Of course your husband isn't wanting to come home. You just throw the kids at him and the house is a mess and you're talking his ear off. That's not pleasant to come home to. I think we forget how we treat our husbands sometimes. (sighs) 
throw the idea of submission aside, but like, how are you even treating your husband? Are you treating him like the man that you love the most on this earth? The man that you chose to take a covenant before the Lord and marry? Or are you treating him like a complete stranger off the side of the road that you completely despise? Like, are we treating our husbands like the man we love or a man that we hate? And we have to go back to what 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not keep any record of wrong. Sure, your husband is a sinner and he will do things that will really piss you off. He will do things that are wrong. He actually will do things that will really hurt you. But love is patient. It's kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It keeps no record of wrong. And the grace that the Lord has for us needs to be the same amount of grace that we extend to our husbands and to our kids. And so I know you maybe you've been married for a really long time and your husband has done some really hurtful things. Take those to the feet of Jesus, keeping record of those things and bringing them up over his head every single time you guys get into an argument is not showing respect. It's not showing love. It's not showing kindness. And so we really, that's why I keep saying you have to go to the feet of Jesus and just give it and pour it out to him and ask him to give you the wisdom, ask him to give you the strength, ask him to give you the peace because it is so much bigger than the idea of us submitting to our husbands. I keep saying this. It is ultimately us submitting to God. It is ultimately us going before him and telling him whether we were in submission to our husbands because the Lord knows what your husband is doing, but he's not asking you to keep record of what your husband is doing. He's asking you to keep record of what you are doing. I just want to make sure that we're all understanding that this is the most biblical thing. I'm not just like whipping this out of my butt. I'm not just whipping this out because I'm having fun telling you all these things because they're not very pleasant things to talk about and no one is really <laughs> for some reason that just caught me off guard for saying that she she's not whipping it out of her butt. <laughs> but um I I'm thinking about how she said how how often are we like being harsh with our husbands or giving them the worst of ourselves. And I think that that's just kind of something that can happen in a marriage is like you you spend the most time with this person and so they're going to see the worst of you. They're going to see the harshest parts of you just by nature of the relationship that you have. And it is really important to make sure that you're not letting the closeness that you have with your spouse get in the way of treating them in the way that you would want to be treated. I don't really know how to express what I'm trying to say, but I feel like when you are in a marriage and you've known somebody for such a long time and you spend so much time with them, it's easy to kind of consider them an extension of yourself instead of a completely separate person. And so you don't necessarily think about maybe moderating your speech or being super in control of it because you're just at that comfort level where you don't think about it. So I think there needs to be kind of like a balance here because on one hand, it is great to be so comfortable with your spouse that you can just be completely yourself. You don't have to worry about saying something wrong or like misspeaking. It's just like, I'm comfortable. Here's how I am and here's who I am. But we also have to remember that our spouse is not us. Like they are not an extension of us. They are their own human being. And it is important to treat them how we would want to be treated and to make sure that we are being kind and loving and respectful, regardless of this whole, the whole submission thing. It's just like, be nice to your spouse. Be nice to the person that you claim to love. And yeah, you're going to have bad days. They're going to see the worst of you. That's just the nature of a marriage. But it's also important to remember that you love them and they love you and to foster that and make sure that you are being healthy to each other and like building each other up. Really talking about it and I feel like that's why the Lord has burdened my heart for this so much because we need to be talking about this. This needs to be said and this needs to be done and there will be a huge wave of movement within the church and within women if this does happen. The, the world changes within the inside of the four walls of your home first, then it bleeds out through there. So let's talk a little bit more practical things. In a moment of conflict, pick a nice and lovely word for you to reference your husband as, such as honey, my love, sweetie my boo-boo, my boo-bear, my goosey goosey my daddy. What, I literally don't care. Think of a sweet word that your husband likes. And when you are in moments of arguments or it is a heated moment, reference and call Gross. him that because it pulls off that defense and it helps you remember that this person that you're in conflict with is a person you claim to love the most. This is a person that you coveted before God to be a uh, wife with. And so I think even you just using when you are in a moment, say, yes, honey. Yes, dear. What was that? 
Because what does Proverbs tell us? Proverbs says that a soft answer turns away a wrath. And so if it is a heated argument, if you come back heated, you're not cooling down the situation. You're heating it back up. But when you answer with a soft answer, yes, honey, or yes, my dear, that ultimately already negotiates and gets rid of a lot of the conflict. Now, I've noticed that there's three words that I've noticed that puts a pause into almost every argument. And that is the words, you are right. Now, you're probably looking at me like, Melina, you're being a doormat. No, I'm not. I'm just choosing and being wise with when I choose to say my words. And I know that in the heat of an argument, telling him that I'm right is not only not submissive, it's disrespectful and it's foolish. And so in the moment of an argument, calling him sweetie and telling him, you know what, honey? Yeah, you are. You are right. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe we do need more of this or fill in the blank. It's honestly never anything ever that serious to begin with. Like I remember one time we were arguing over, I think my husband got upset because we didn't have enough soap in the house. And he was like, you need to buy more soap. And I was like, yes, honey, you're right. I do need to. Boom. Flustered situation went down to zero and we moved on. Another phrase that pauses. Why is he starting a fight with you over needing to buy more soap? You're right. That is a silly argument. That's nothing to fight over. If you don't have soap, he is right. You, you, you need to buy more soap on a base level. He would be correct. But why is he starting a fight with you over not having soap? It's almost every argument is I agree with you because oftentimes this reminds them that we're on the same team. This reminds me that I'm on the same team as my husband. We're not against each other. It's him and I against the enemy. And the enemy wants nothing more than to come straight in between you and your husband and completely divide you and divide your family. The enemy is after your marriage from the second you even decide you want to be together. Like the enemy is after your marriage all day long. He's after your bed. He's after your children. He's after it. And he's furious that you have a marriage before the Lord. Like that alone infuriates him. So if you're going to be a submissive wife, oof, he's really threatened by you. So oh, are we following? Okay. Now I want to just be very candid here because I think sometimes when talking about this, it can seem like one knows all of what they're doing. And I want to very humbly make it known that this is something that I'm constantly having to go to the Lord for in work. And just, this is a constant prayer of mine every single day. I'm praying for this, you guys, because it's not easy and I really do need the Lord, but it has gotten easier. It has been easier to tame my tongue. It has become second nature. Nature. Once the habit was broken, it feels like these chains were broken off and I was able to easily submit to even the silliest of things. And I'd say like right now where I feel like I'm currently working on is the time of I um, the idea of time because my husband and I are very different. I am very time oriented. I love to be on time and early for things. And my husband is not. He's the opposite of me. He is the type of man that when he gets into conversation, he is fully, his whole heart is in that conversation. And so he loses track of time. And I think that's beautiful. Because that shows that he's more interested in a person's soul. He's more interested in community and talking to a person than silly time. And so this has definitely humbled me in a lot of areas because the Lord's really just showed me how beautiful my husband's heart is and how much wrong I had. And so this is an area that I'm currently working on in regards to submission and just making sure that I am holding my tongue, that I'm being wise with my words and I'm not coming back. And so, yeah, this is definitely not going to be the last. I have more things that I would like to share in regards to sex and submission and regards to Mm. day to day. Mm. And I have a lot more to say on this topic. So stay tuned for uh, part three. Alarm bells just went off in my head. Oh, and uh, part four of this, if there's something that you have found that made it easier for you to submit or areas where you feel like has been really impossible, but the Lord has given you victory and ground over this area, share it with us, please, because I think it is super encouraging to hear other wives, how their whole life has been transformed and how their whole marriage has been transformed just by this simple act of submission. And in the coming episodes too, I'd love to talk about being a prayerful wife because there have been so many prayers that the Lord has answered that I have not even had to say a single thing to my husband. I took it to the Lord and within a day it has been resolved. Or this happened literally last week, within the hour the Lord convicted my husband of something and I didn't even have to say anything. Like, It is crazy how the Lord answers our prayers, how being pure and holy and bringing it before the Lord. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. It is so cool. It's so cool. So I would love to talk more about that because it is all just so interlaced. But I love you guys. Be blessed.
Well, there you have it. That is part two of Milena's submission series. You'll have to let me know what you thought about it and the ideas that she shared, as well as the ones that I shared. If you agree, if you disagree, however you feel about it, I would love to hear. And if you want me to keep reacting to Milena videos, please let me know. I'm not sure if this is something that you want to see going forward. Um, it, I, I can't quite pin down how I feel about her yet. It's like with Brittany, I feel like I can pretty much react to anything she puts out because she's spreading harmful messaging and I think she's being disingenuous in a lot of the things that she says. So it's very easy to be like, nope, 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 pick this out. Nope, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But with Milena, it's like, I can't quite figure out the angle if this is just something like going kind of like deeper and deeper into being a, a traditional wife and this religious like I don't want to say devotion because then it sounds like I'm knocking her for being devout in her religion, um, but kind of taking it to a bit of an extreme level. I don't know if this is something that she's just figuring out for herself and maybe she's going to go back and forth at some point. She'll be like, well, maybe I went a little bit too far in this direction, so let's kind of self-correct and we'll go a more moderate route. I have no idea, but if you want to see more Milena reactions or if there are certain videos that she's posted that you want me to react to, definitely let me know. Um, you can leave that in the comment section down below if you are watching on YouTube and also leave any other thoughts that you might want to share there. And if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify, you can share your thoughts in the Q&A section for the specific episode. And while you are doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel or leaving the podcast a rating and a review, that would be incredible. And if you have done any of those things already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you. And I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.